Uh, thanks, Aaron, for the introduction and for collaborating with me on this um, symposium. Um, so I'm going to introduce th this um, finding, but in addition introduce a study that will be part of two presentations today. Um, Krista is also going to be presenting some data from this trial. This is a trial that was conducted by Barbara Stanley um, over the last several years. And one of the main um, goals of this trial was not just to look at treatment outcome between DBT and an SSRI treatment for borderline, but to kind of set a framework so we could start looking at um, the relationship between symptomatic and behavioral changes with various um, neurobiological parameters. So the two main approaches we used were uh, social stress as assessed by cortisol reactivity to a standardized social stressor, and fMRI uh, using two tasks that were designed to measure emotion regulation and its change over the course of six months of treatment. So I'm going to be presenting the first, and Crystal will be presenting the second. Um, so just as by way of background, our knowledge of the biomarkers of BPD is, um, is limited, but it's growing. And this knowledge is crucial because it helps us unravel the mechanisms of the disorder, and then how those mechanisms might inform measurement of treatment um, and how treatment works. Um, little is known about the biological mechanisms underlying particularly psychotherapeutic treatments, um, a little bit more, of course, by psychopharmacological treatments just by their very nature. Um, so we came to this um, study because we had been doing uh, studies of the HPA axis in uh, the division of um, uh, we call MIND at PI, directed by John Mann, using, using um, the Trier social stress test. And so for this grant, we, we sought to see if we could use it actually as a, a change measure of stress response before and after two types of treatment. In particular, we're looking, going to be looking at cortisol changes during this, before, during, and after this stressor task that I'm going to tell you about. Um, the HPA axis, as many of you might know, is an endocrine system that's involved in the psychobiological response to stressors. Um, it's a homeostatic system that involves both the appraisal of some external stressor or threat, uh, which then leads to a combination of emotional response and a metabolic response physiologically. Um, interactions between the HP axis and the sympathetic nervous system are key to an adaptive stress response. So we all need some sort of HPA responsivity to deal with both major and minor stressors throughout life. Um, just as a schematic, this is, a, this is an attempt to sort of uh, simplify and make visually appealing this homeostatic mechanism. Uh, I'm not going to go through all these steps, but the, um, the main variable that we're going to be looking at is cortisol response in the saliva in response to uh, timed and standardized stressor. The HP axis in BPD is a, is a bit hard to understand because there have been actually quite conflicting findings, um, not only in BPD, but as I've learned as I try to delve into this literature, but in depression, in various stress syndromes, um, in suicidal behavior. Uh, there really is not that, cons that, that much consistent, um, th that many consistent findings. However, despite that, um, there does seem to be some general, you might say, dysregulation. The direction of the dysregulation is a little bit unclear. Some studies suggest blunted. Some studies suggest hyperactive response. But all these things are confounded by all kinds of things, such as, you know, uh, biological sex, uh, you know, um, what time of day you do the test, uh, you know, um, whether you're on a medication, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there is only one study that I'm aware of that looked at HPA axis in treatment of borderlines, and that was a medication study of uh, fluvoxamine. And in addition, they didn't use a social stress test. They used a dexamethasone suppression test, which is more of a pharmacologic challenge. Uh, and they found that, um, that the, the, the medication reduced the responsiveness of the HPA axis in BPD. Um, so our study fills a little bit of a void in that we are using we're comparing two treatments, one of which is psychopharmacologic primarily, the other which is um, psychosocial. And uh, we're not using a um, pharmacologic challenge to test HPA. We're using a, a standardized social stressor to test the HPA axis. And the two primary um, ways in which we looked at um, uh, cortisol response are represented here. 
Uh, the first is the peak response. So, you know, during this during the task, and so this is a kind of visual representation of how you can look at cortisol response. The uh, y-axis is the um, salivary cortisol level. The um, x-axis is the time with the stressor beginning at the um, in this gray area here. And so you get a baseline measure about 15 minutes before the stressor, and then you get uh, repeated measures. Uh, usually following the stressor and then in five to ten minute increments afterwards because it takes about 20 minutes for cortisol to kind of make it to your salivary uh, system. So what you're, what you're capturing in saliva is actually what occurred 20 minutes before. Um, so to measure cortisol response, we, we really wanted to, to know what's their peak response, but we also, we also wanted to know, like, what's the overall, you know, strength of the response, and we use something called an area under the curve with the logarithmic transformation to measure that. Um, so the purpose of the study was to examine differences in both baseline and, um, and change over time in, in cortisol response to a standardized social stressor uh, in individuals who are randomized to either a psychosocial treatment, DBT, or primarily a psychopharm management with some um, clinical uh, care. Some very minimal clinical support. Um, these are the inclusion criteria, which I, I don't need to go into in depth. Um, I, I will highlight, though, that all the borderline patients had some recent uh, suicidal behavior, either in either a, an attempt or um, self-injury of some sort, or both. Um, And these are the exclusion criteria. These are fairly standard in BPD research at this point, um, just to be sure we weren't including people who might have a primary psychotic di diagnosis or a bipolar one condition, et cetera, um, and were clinically stable enough to um, participate in an outpatient treatment program. Um, so this is the, the flow of the study. So they would be enrolled. They'd go through pretreatment study procedures. Um, they would be randomized. The pretreatment study procedures included the... Um, the TSST and the fMRI that we're going to hear about. They were randomized to the DBT or the SSRI treatment, and then there were uh, post-study assessments and repeats of the, the TC, TSST and the um, uh, fMRI procedures. So the DBT is standard DBT um, done by certified therapists. Um, the SSRI basically started out with um, fluoxetine with gradual increase in dose. If there was no response, there was a switch to another SSRI, and if they failed uh, various SSRIs, then they were um, considered for, uh, you know, a non-SSRI treatment if needed, but I, I don't know, the, I think the vast majority ended up being on an SSRI for the duration of the trial. Um, so here's the Trier that we use. It's, it's somewhat modified. So we would get a, a, um, a baseline mood assessment from the POMS. Uh, we would have people do a 15-minute stressor with two Confederates wearing white lab coats similar to this. Um, we didn't set up a camera. We thought that might be a little too stressful, but uh, we did have th this um, uh, five-minute speech where the participant was invited to talk about themselves and their personality for five minutes with very little feedback from the assessors. They just had their clipboards and their, um, you know, their stern faces. Um, and if the participant didn't, didn't want to keep going, we would just encourage them to keep going. And, and But we wouldn't tell them actually how much time was left, so they, that was a little bit of a... Uh, uh, ambiguous um, anxiety-inducing cue in and of itself. And then after that, we had them do a speeded arithmetic task that um, got progressively more difficult over several minutes, so that, and that when they would make a mistake, they would get feedback, wrong, wrong. So you could imagine that over time, you're getting mentally fatigued, and then you're getting more feedback that you're performing poorly. Um, so this definitely stresses people out. After that, we would do four more cortisol ratings, get two more mood ratings, et cetera. Um, so these are the data analyses we did. We, did, we looked at baseline cortisol values, cortisol response, uh, and then we looked at the peak cortisol response. Um, and the, the main areas, the, the, really the main um, areas of interest were these, the, the area under the curve and the peak, because those represent the, the stress response, not just baseline cortisol, which is um, less relevant to how, you, how your HP axis responds to a very specific stressor. Um, the groups were comparable on most of the major indices that we looked at, uh, do, so the randomization seemed to work. Um, behaviorally, as a backdrop, you should know that DBT over six months did seem to reduce uh, suicide attempt uh, frequency relative to the psychopharm group, um, and 
uh, suicide event risk as well. Um, so as far as the Trier findings, there was no baseline differences in cortisol at pretreatment. Um, but at post-treatment, the SSRI condition actually had lower baseline cortisol values than the um, DBT group. But remember, the baseline is not as, re is not as, is not as important for the purpose of the HPA axis as the area under the curve and the peak. Um, so the, the, really the most interesting and main findings were that um, the DBT group post-treatment had lower cortisol response to the Trier, and that when you look at change, that is, look at the cortisol area under the curve when controlling for the baseline area under the curve, the DBT group had a larger reduction in area under the curve than the um, psychopharm group. Um, and that is represented here. So you can see that the uh, DBT group in the dark black line had a, a general reduction in uh, peak cortisol response from time one to time two, where you have the opposite effect in the medication group. And this was um, similar in the peak cortisol response, so it's, it essentially is the same pattern. Um, uh, so what does this mean? So, so um, what, what was intrig interesting, and Barbara mentioned this yesterday, was that um, despite this difference in, in stress responsivity, which suggests perhaps a better regulatory stress system in the psychosocial treatment relative to the psychopharm treatment, we weren't able to tie that to any, any of the primary outcome variables like suicidality. It seems somewhat independent of um, that behavioral difficulty. We're, 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 we're not done yet. We're going to see if perhaps uh, cortisol change might be a mediator of change, for example. Uh, but I also just wanted to pitch this study that I presented last year at this meeting where we looked at um, using the same cortisol stress procedure, the Trier, um, and we had a mixed sample of people with BPD and affective disorder and then affective disorder without BPD. The main finding was that the diagnosis um, didn't predict a positive cortisol response, that is a, a greater area into the curve, but rejection sensitivity did um, across both groups. And that this accounted for, you know, th this really was carrying the variance, not, not the diagnosis per se. So one possibility is that um, What's getting better is rejection sensitivity. The other, the other variables that we found that seem to influence a, a more positive stress response are impulsive aggression. So these, these are two kind of candidate um, tra traits or mediators that we are going to start looking at with, reg with regard to trying to understand these reductions in um, social stress responsivity. Um, so just to sum up, um, the DBT group compared to the SSRI group had lower cortisol response to stress post-treatment, a reduction in cortisol response over time. Uh, DBT was more effective than the medications in reducing suicidal behavior. And it could be that, you know, the, the basic core strategies of DBT are emotion regulation and um, tolerance and, that, and mindfulness, and that these, these techniques may account for these reductions in um, stress response over time. Um, I also just want to mention that when we first did the study, we weren't actually sure that this procedure could be repeated. That is, um, is it, you know, can, can you give someone basically the same procedure twice over six months and see enough change? That is, do they habituate perhaps to the procedure or does it not, is it not robust enough in the second administration? Um, I'm, I'm happy to say that that does not seem to be the case. And not only that, it seemed to really capture some, something important in the difference between these two treatments over time and their, and their potential mechanisms. Um, uh, so, so cortisol response, you know, seems like a decent candidate um, <coughs> marker, particularly in response to social stress for um, treatment outcome in BPD. Um, but future research really needs to determine how it works and how it's linked to clinical symptom change or trait change, um, which is something we're still investigating. Uh, so I'll just end there. And this is these are members of the team who helped collect and analyze and do various things with this data. As you can imagine, this was a very procedure-intensive study where you've got, you know, a lot of high-risk borderline patients doing a lot of difficult procedures, both an fMRI and TSST and hours of assessment. So this is a, I want, we should recognize everyone who contributed to that. And of course, thank the patients who helped us learn this. Thank you.